Hello, I'm Sarah Spateri, and you're listening to The Well-Crafted Life, the new podcast from Homes and Gardens that considers one big question. How do we enhance our homes? And so, our lives. Every week, I'll be asking three tastemakers to share three secrets. It's a podcast that focuses as much on the little things as the big things, because a well-crafted life is made up of both. I hope you enjoy the show. This episode of The Well-Crafted Life is sponsored by Martin Moore, Classic English Kitchens. This episode's theme is living in nature. My creatives come from the realms of design, floristry and cooking, and each draws energy and positivity from the natural world. First, we'll hear from Willow Crosley, a fantastic florist who creates wild and whimsical arrangements full of pattern and movement. My second guest is garden designer Marion Boswell, Hers is one of the UK's leading practices, best known for beautiful schemes in historic or sensitive settings. Finally, we're joined by food writer James Rich, author of the best-selling cookbook, Apple. Get ready for an inspiration overload as we talk about the countryside, colour at home, argo cooking, meditation spirals, listening to the land, and the joys of having a veg patch. I'd like to introduce my first guest, Floris Willow Crosley. Thank you for joining me, Willow. Oh, it's such a pleasure, Sarah. Thank you for having me. Now, I've been asking all my podcast guests to kick off with a description of their home. So could you tell us all about where you live, who you live with and what you fill it with? Of course. So I live in a little village in West Oxfordshire, just outside Woodstock with my husband, Charlie, and my three boys who are called Wolf, Rafferty and Kit. And our house is a kind of very typical Cotswoldy cottage. And it's three cottages stuck together over time. So it's very higgledy-piggledy. The ceilings are quite low. Not not that I'm thrilled about that. I'm all about space and light. And so we have one room in the house that has got kind of double height ceilings. And that's definitely my favourite room. We moved from London and it was the first house we saw. We just literally fell in love with it. And a week later, we kind of, we were here. I was pregnant with Raph, our middle one, when we moved. And I always think you should never do any decorating when you're pregnant because I look back now and I'm like what the hell was I doing everything's kind of <laughs> grey and just awful so for the last kind of couple of years we've been undoing all those terrible decisions that I'd made at the time like, you know that thing of when you're pregnant and you're kind of nesting I guess and you just want it done you want the builders out of your house so I was just kind of chucking colours that would come to the front of my brain at them so it was just done whereas now I'm kind of taking time to actually use fabrics and wallpapers and stuff that I really love and want to be surrounded by. And colour is one of the secrets that you shared for how you enhance your home. Which colours are you particularly drawn to? Generally, I think the brighter colours, green and blue, 100% always. But now I very much use colour to kind of brighten my mood. So be it in my clothes or in my interiors. So I've got this lovely Indian kind of camphor quilt that I got on eBay, which is bright emeraldy green with whitish cream palm trees all over and I have that thrown over a rather disgusting fabric sofa Uh, (laughs) the whole of that room is very loosely not really intentionally but based around that green and then I have these lampshades that I got from Oka probably a year ago which are bright red and cream stripes and we have two in the kitchen and they're huge and they just make me so happy so yeah more and more things are kind of revolving around those two pieces that's the my focal point that I always kind of look to and And do you think you're more drawn to colors that you you know natural colors so you mentioned greens initially do you think there's something in that obviously being a florist and being very much immersed in nature do you think you're more drawn to natural colors I don't know actually I mean when you say natural I guess so much there's there's all that kind of taupe palette isn't there there's that kind of whites and neutrals I'm definitely not drawn to those maybe like colorful natural (laughs) yeah well (laughs) flowers are so colorful so actually you know there's every color in flowers Exactly. I think it's more bright than natural, but definitely I'm very drawn to natural things. So natural fabrics and materials. So cotton and wood. Our house is filled with that. So we've got lots of kind of lovely driftwood lamps and linen cushions and curtains and all that kind of stuff. The idea of kind of having polyester and kind of man-made fabrics doesn't fill me with a lot of joy. (laughs) Yeah, that's actually your second secret of the natural world from materials to also prints. 
yeah so all our all the fabrics are covered in flowers and seed pods and trees and so that room the our sitting room which has got the palm tree quilt throw thing i've then got a uh, palm tree fabric which again i got from i think it was etsy or ebay um made in india and it's literally block printed palm trees everywhere so it does feel very natural and wild everywhere when did you first realize that kind of floristry was for you talk us through how your creative creator date has kind of evolved so i so i write i write books and my second book i wrote was all about living with nature it's called inspire the art of living with nature and in that i did a section of living with flowers specifically and it just it it's like i kind of one of those light bulb moments when it just made me feel so happy and excited and at the time i was doing writing styling fashion personal shopping and i had two small children and i just felt like i was very frazzled and spreading myself too thin so i knew i had to kind of rein it in a little and maybe kind of be a bit more specific with what i was doing so i was like Do you know what i'm just going to stop everything else and focus on the flowers so i went and did um a week's intensive course at the covent garden flower academy it was my realisation that this is what I wanted to do. And I kind of went from there and never looked back. You do courses or not necessarily courses, but sort of instructional videos. Is that because you're sort of keen to share that experience that you had? Yeah, well, do you know what I do? I have an online course as well with Create Academy. So I do that. And then I do lots of Instagram videos. And yeah, I really enjoy teaching. And I think now having we've been in lockdown for so long now, I think people are realizing how beneficial it is to our kind of emotional well-being and how kind of switching off from getting off those screens and immersing ourselves in soil or flowers and focusing on that is just so beneficial and life enhancing and I and I just love that and it gives me such a buzz being able to share it and people come in going oh my god it's just making me so happy and I find that so exciting. So do you think it you're particularly drawn to the fact that you're you know making something with you know that comes from the soil do you think that's the charm that you find in floristry? I don't know I think what gives me my biggest buzz in life is creating things. So whether it's an arrangement, I, I, I'm creating something, it sounds really probably a bit weird, but creating something really beautiful, that's what makes me so excited. So creating a beautiful arrangement or the way the garden looks, or it's not actually the fact that I'm playing with soil or flowers. I don't think, I've never really kind of tried to analyse why I love it so much. Are you um, a keen gardener as well? I love it, but I'm not very good at it yet. My, my my parents are incredible gardeners. And when we were little, they used to drive us mad by kind of spending their whole life weeding. And we'd be like, oh, <laughs> in the garden again. And now I'm totally hooked, but I have got so much to learn. And I'm that's kind of what on my list of to-do is I'm desperate to do a garden course. I think we're going to do one. Have you heard of Angel Collins? She's the most incredible yes. gardener. So I think she's going to, we're going to get a group together and she's going to teach us. So, yes, I do love to garden. <laughs> How have you found the adjustment from living in London to living in the Cotswolds? God, well, it was a long time ago now. It's kind of, mm. nearly, I've been here for nearly 10 years. The idea of being in the city now fills me with horror. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just because I, I love that space. I love being able to walk out my door and be in the woods in five minutes time. But I think it was probably a bit of a shock at the time. And I, what I missed is the ease of everything. It's that thing of being able to walk out and get a coffee or going, oh, God, I've forgotten to buy some milk. You have to plan a lot more living in the countryside, I find. And I am terrible at planning. <laughs> On a typical day, are you able to get out and, you know, explore the woods and really kind of enjoy the surrounding area? That's kind of what I do for my mental well-being is I a walk is my thing. I try and get into yoga and all that, but I, I'm, I'm not very good at it. So the walking is my one thing that I have to do every single day. That's my exercise, my emotional well-being, all that all rolled in one. But I go into the woods, I walk our little dog and yeah, so I'm definitely out there every single day. And if I'm not, I get this build up of adrenaline in my legs and I can feel that I haven't been out. I go a bit mad. <laughs> the third secret is bringing in flowers and plants, which I think, as yeah. we would imagine, your home is full of, you know, in my mind, your home is full of things from the natural world. Mm -hmm. Tell us why that's so important to you. I just feel that, so you know, you walk into a beautiful room and it's all lovely. I just feel that if there is no flower or plant or it just doesn't feel 
complete. I feel that having bringing plants and flowers into your house, be it just like big spring branches or something, it doesn't have to be some beautiful swanky arrangement. I just think something, it just breathes life into a room, into a home, and it, it feels like you you care for it much more. Are there any plants that you particularly love to use for that? Mm, so it's very much a kind of a seasonal thing. So always pelargoniums and geraniums through the year, but and spring bulbs, and then it's oh, it's nearly tulip time. So that is a huge highlight of my year. So the tulip season and the dahlia season is my absolute favourite thing. And wow. for those, I always try and buy British from local growers. I've got these incredible growers and friends called the Land Gardeners, and they I mean, just to fill the house with that is the absolute dream it totally depends what i've got on offer depending on the season that we're in what month we're in but there'll always be something so bulbs when there's no cut flowers and cut flowers it will depend on the month i've got an image of you in in your kitchen would you say that is the heart of your home are you a keen cook Mm. (laughs) it's definitely the heart of the home i i'm obsessed with food and cookbooks and i spend often i'll go to bed with a cookbook rather than a novel but Lockdown one kind of ruined cooking for me. I'm sure I'll get back to it. <laughs> but Charlie's the most incredible cook. That's his role in, in lockdown anyway, when he's, cause we have a pub in Charbury. So he has been doing lots of takeout pizzas and burgers. Oh, and perfect. Pizza and yeah. Pizza. So when he's not there, he is our, he is our magical chef. Willow, thank you so much for your time. You filled my mind with colour and flowers and you know, talked about the joys of kind of natural materials. I've really enjoyed chatting. I just want to interrupt to talk to you about Martin Moore. Specialists in bespoke kitchen furniture, Martin Moore is known for classic English design with an elegant, timeless style. Committed to excellence and British craftsmanship, all their kitchens are custom designed and handmade to order in their UK workshops. To find out about Martin Moore and their kitchens, head to their website martinmoore.com or follow them on Instagram at martinmoordesign. My second guest on Living in Nature is landscape architect Marian Boswell. Hi, Marian. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Sarah. Thank you for having me. How are you today? Yeah, really well, thank you. Great. So we'll kick off this podcast by you telling us about your home. So um, I, I live in Kent. I live in an old farmhouse. It's on well, it's on the first ripple of the High Weald, really. It's a rather lovely place. We we overlook a valley, and we are we don't really have very close neighbours. It's an old farmhouse, and it's got a nice um, symmetry. It's uh, partly fourteen nineties and partly nineteen forties. It's yes, yeah, mixture of medieval nice and history. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, so there's bottle glass windows, pre raphaelite ladies in, in the uh, leaded windows, and it's a place full of books and fireplaces and rugs, and it's quite messy. And do you live with your family? Yes, I live with my family, although my, my son and daughter have recently flown the nest. My husband's here, and then we live... Our family's quite extended in that we have dogs, we have cats, and then we live in the house we have bees, we have bats, we have house martins. <laughs> wow. Um, and then outside the house, we have more bees and hens and foxes and rabbits, you know, you, the heron, the kingfisher. Yeah. So we have, we have a lot of extended family. And when did you realise that nature would be so much part of your everyday? Gosh, that's an interesting question. Did, would I have called it nature then? I used to garden with my grandmother. That's one of my very earliest memories, really, was gardening with her. And she was very kind and everybody always used to say that I was very like her. And I used to count her age about five, well, without the wrinkles. Um, <laughs> so yes, she was a very favourite part of my life. And I think that's my earliest uh, memory was just the the wonder of things growing and just being amazed when little things poke their noses up through the soil. And I still find that incredibly exciting. Yeah. Actually, that, that makes me think of your, your first secret, which is a book that you read when you were about 12. Yes. So that, I think, was the first time when I really realised that it was such an important thing to understand how things grow. And uh, so I was 12 and I just went into the school library and took this book off the shelf. It was called The Day of the Triffids. I don't know if people listening to this will will remember it, but it was a sort of sci-fi in which these um, marauding plants, which are are created by man, then sort of take over the world. And the, the scary thing is not just that they take over the world, but what happens to the survivors? Because they have to learn to start again without any of the technology and all the comforts that we're used to. 
and grow everything, grow their own food and make everything from scratch. And that really made me think age 12, gosh, I, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how yeah. to grow food and I don't know how to look after the world. And somehow it became important in that funny way that things can when you're that age. And from then on, I just had this real sort of connection with trying to work out how how we could look after the, the earth, really. Mm-hmm. And then tell us, obviously, I know your practice quite well, but tell the audience about your design ethos. Well, it's quite a gentle ethos. We, uh, I mean, I'm incredibly lucky. Uh, I always feel hugely grateful when anybody hires us and we have lovely work and lovely clients. I think it's it's because we're trying to do the same thing together. The people I work with in, in my studio are obviously carefully picked by me, but they are wonderful people in their own rights and have the same ethos which is really about caring for the land and a few years ago I went on a a course actually with somebody called Elizabeth Kearns and she really pinpointed why are you doing what you're doing and I said well I just feel that I'm a a guardian of the land and and when I said it I felt kind of a bit woo and a bit really to myself and then I thought well actually no that is what I feel and once you embrace what it is you really want to do, I think it's amazing how that then guides everything. Everything you do is against that measure. It's are we doing the right thing? Are we being kind? Are we you know, thinking long term? Are we I mean sustainability is obviously the word which encompasses this sort of this view. But it's a bit it's a bit deeper than that. It's kind of listening listening to the land. And at the moment we're all being told in no uncertain terms that we need to slow down. And how does this translate into what your garden looks like? Ah, my garden is very comfortable. It's a, I, I say that slightly wryly because it's not a tidy place. It, <laughs> um, it's, 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 well, it's, you know, I have clipped forms. I have some beach outside my studio. I'm looking at three clipped hornbeam sentinels, really. But next to them, there's a huge crab apple, which is brilliant at this time of year for the birds and then in the center I I did have a big lawn but uh, a couple of years ago I had been making labyrinths for clients in this sort of old Chartres method which is a very sort of meditative spiritual thing to walk and I looked at that big lawn and thought you know we could just put a big spiral there and we just did it's just mown it's a very simple mown path so that's the center of our lawn now and the great thing is that you immediately get well, 50% less work on the yeah. 50% less diesel um, using up or petrol, whatever you've got each each time, but also all that all that biodiversity. So it's full of wildflower and bees and, and butterflies. It's, it's le- yes, and we all walk it. The studio, all of my team walk it. Uh, I walk it in the mornings. I walked it in the frost. Gosh, that's quite tough on the feet. Because this um, is your second secret, isn't it? Making time for barefoot meditation. Yes. Yeah, so the second secret is making time to connect in any way. Yeah. So I'm, I mean, obviously I have, like you, I have a very busy job and sometimes it stretches into evenings and weekends. And so you can become quite, in your head, you can become quite sort of busy minded. And so yeah. just making time to connect is is really the way I stay sane. So yes, the meditation and the barefoot. So when we go to clients, even we take off our shoes, we feel the earth, we try to connect. And it's amazing what it does to you. You just get this wonderful energy, wonderful feeling of groundedness. And, and it clears your mind. Well, it clears my mind in a way that allows creativity in. So yes, it's something that, that um, I do try to make time for, along with hugging trees, which is really important. <laughs> so yes, I know it sounds crazy, but it, it works. Not at all. It sounds great. Now, have you, you know, we've talked a lot about the benefits of um, this kind of approach to, um, well, to life, but also to, to gardening. Have you faced any challenges coming, you know, as a sort of studio that really promotes this very sustainable approach and listening to the land. What are the challenges that you face? I think our challenges are unpicking and understanding what we're doing. So at the moment, I've also co-founded something called the Sustainable Landscape Foundation with with Eric Anderson. And that was really started because we were just trying to understand how to do the best with the materials that we have. And the, I'm sure the interiors world has this as well. So for example, we we created a large conservation lake, uh, but it was on a, a chalk base. So we lined it. So then you have to look into what the line is made of and how sustainable that is. 
And on a on a smaller scale, in a garden, if you're going to lay down concrete, what's the embodied carbon in that? If you're going to mm. reuse things. So really it's it's understanding what goes into all of our materials. And that is an issue for my studio, but it's an issue for the whole industry. And I think lots of different people are working on trying to unpick what goes into everything at the moment so that we can really understand all the way down the supply chain. You know, if you're buying some Chinese or Indian sandstone, you might be supporting child labor. It's yeah. so really understanding what the impact is of what we do. I think that's our biggest challenge. That's really interesting. So you, you mentioned your studio is in the grounds of your house. Is that right? Yes. It's in an old coach house. So it's, it's it was a toss up between um, renting somewhere or converting this space. And I really like welcoming people to this space. I mentioned that the studio walks the meditation spiral with me. They like to come and feed the chickens. We can see what grows. We do plant um, testing and talking about what's growing. The garden's full of trees. It's sort of six acres, mostly of trees. So we go out, and particularly with new people who are joining us, it's great to go out and see what's happening in the land. It's an old converted, well, coach house. So basically I took the ceiling out, and put high rafters and big lamps and a big glass front on. And then the windows were these old metal windows. So we filled them in with old mirrors and put them on a blank wall so it helps to reflect the light. Yeah, it sounds beautiful. So it's, a, it's, it's really warm. It's much warmer than my house, actually. <laughs> so, yes, it's very insulated and hardly uses any electricity. So it's, uh, yes, I spend a lot of time out here. And then back inside your house, do you have any particular objects or a room that you feel particularly enhances or, you know, you find particularly nurturing? Well, uh, funnily enough, when you were asking about the three secrets, the thing which came to to mind was was my bed. So uh, the the bed is um, is a lovely story. It was uh, we went to stay with uh, some great friends, Rob and Candida Machin, who used to run a very high class bed and breakfast. And we slept in this bed, which was the most comfortable bed we'd ever slept in and after we stayed there we we said to them look if you ever um, move we'd love to buy your bed from you and and they stopped running this amazing bed and breakfast so that rob could be a full-time painter which he is he's an amazing artist and they gave us the bed and it's um (laughs) it's one of those two thousand pocket sprung beds with a zip up the middle uh, so that you don't roll into each other and uh, I'm very interested in feng shui so we we got a headboard because I think headboards are one of the really important things to give you support and you know rest in in the house it's, it gives you a very good grounding energy so we've got this lovely headboard made by Pippa Sedgwick and yes getting into bed for me is a fantastic refuge I love it and every night I say to my husband this is the comfiest bed in the world <laughs> so important to have that and I, as you know sleep is the secret weapon isn't it i think it really is sleep is the secret weapon. sleep and rest and if you're if you're doing something you love and you're well rested then i think that it's quite it's easy to be happy very lucky marion thank you so much for your time from your grandmother first introducing you to nature through meditation spirals and hugging trees to you know the importance of sleep i've really loved talking to you and you've really given us a sense of how we can use nature to enhance the everyday My final guest is food writer James Rich. Hi, James. Welcome. Hi, Sarah. Hi. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. James, you're a bit of a special guest on the podcast, being the partner of my colleague, Living Etc. editor Pip McCormack. Pip and James very recently left their lives in London and moved to a small village in Somerset. Tell us about your new home and what it is like to be a new convert to country living. So we moved, we found the house, well, just under a year ago on Right Move, one of my favourite websites. Um, <laughs> and we were looking to uh, looking to move down to Somerset and we found this beautiful Bathstone, Georgian style house that's about 160 years old in this tiny little, it's, it's kind of not really a village, it's more of a hamlet, but a kind of large hamlet. It doesn't have a shop or anything like that. So a really secluded, beautiful part of the countryside near to where I grew up. And we came in and looked at it and just completely fell in love. Pip is a big fan of Bath Stone and it's quite unusual to find that in this part of Somerset. So yeah, it's very beautiful. Did it take a really big leap of faith to make such a significant change? Absolutely. I mean, if you go back 12 months ago, I was adamant that I was spending another 10 years in London because I just couldn't see how my work and and also Pip's work could happen 
remotely or anywhere else other than London. So it was a really quick kind of change of mindset when we entered lockdown and you ha- we were confined by the city, which, you know, is great. I, I absolutely love London and I still do, but it's, you know, it is great at, at, in the good times. But when you're kind of confined into small spaces, we were really itching for open space, green space, and really wanting to get back to that. So it kind of, it sped up our decision making by about 10 years. Yeah. And have your habits changed? Has your day-to-day routine shifted now you're living in a much more natural environment? Yeah, absolutely. So I think that we are massively influenced by nature um, and we are so fortunate because we've got a lovely garden at the new house. I have my own veg patch. I've got an orchard as well. Um, which is which is hugely exciting for me. And that's your first secret for how you elevate the everyday, your veg patch and your orchard. Yeah, so um, we've just put it in, so it's brand new, but our we have this little habit of every morning we go out into the paddock, we take down the compost, we, you know, the kitchen scraps from the kitchen, and then we just have a little walk around, we kind of take it all in. We're currently in the process of, of working out exactly what we can and can't do within the space because there are trees that have been in our paddock for many, many years. And so we're, we're just kind of sitting back and just watching it change through yeah, the seasons at the moment. Lovely. So we moved here in the autumn. So we've seen the change between autumn and winter. And now we're starting to see spring. And just watching that change is, is so inspirational and beautiful. Are you planning to grow most of your own food? Yes. So my dream is to be somewhat self-sufficient this year. We've got the whole uh, veg area. We've just built four raised beds and a nice herb garden. And I have all my seeds in the greenhouse at the moment. So I'm really excited. I, I grew up around all of this sort of stuff, but I've never really had my own space to do it. And so I'm absolutely loving at the moment learning about all of the different elements of growing your own food and and putting it into practice. And I'm I'm so excited for, you know, hitting summer and, and autumn when it's kind of harvest time. And I've got this dream of us not having to go to the supermarket for a number of weeks during that time because we're going to be harvesting our own food and cooking it in our own kitchen. Do you think growing your own will change the way you cook, how you approach recipe writing or your style of cooking? Yeah, it definitely does. It's already changed my approach to my recipe writing even even, even before I've started really. So I'm, I'm working on my second book at the moment and the theme of that book is all around my orchard and, and the veg patch. And so Great. it's kind of telling the story of, of what I'm going through at the moment with it. But it's already changed because I'm looking at my recipes and I need to make sure that the, the recipes that I'm writing, every element of that is is very embedded within the season. Um, yeah. And so for example, I'm a big fan of stews put them on the um in the oven overnight or you know eight hours during the day and just the idea of kind of hitting autumn and being able to pick you know butternut squashes and and courgettes and all of the lovely root vegetables and bringing them in and putting them in a big pot leaving them in the oven for a number of hours that is that is so so exciting to me but I need to make sure that that all of the other ingredients that go into that are all complementary in terms of the season and so people aren't having to source things that are out of season. Your first book Apple was built around one ingredient. How does that work when it comes to seasonality? It's quite difficult. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, with Apple, um, it was a blessing and a curse in the sense that uh, it was it was my first book. I'd not written one before. Um, I'd not particularly, I'd not written many recipes. And so it was great to have this kind of structure in place that I had to focus on this one ingredient. All of its different guises, whether it was the kind of the fruit or the or cider vinegar or, or apple juice or cider. I had a quite a clear structure with it, which was great. But then when you think of seasonality, I mean, you know, I'm a big advocate of, of sourcing your produce locally um, where you can and where you have it available to you locally. But that means that, you know, the apple season is from August until, well, it can go on until kind of December, January, but um, certainly until October time. But the reality of it is that you can also source them with, in supermarkets. So it was, I tried in that book to really encourage people to get out and try locally sourced varieties because they're just incredibly, the flavours are incredible and the, the homegrown produce we have in this country is second to none do you have Um, apple trees in your orchard it's a mix we've got all sorts of things in there we've got apple trees we've got plum trees we've got walnut tree which i'm so excited we tasted some of the walnuts last night actually from last year we had some the, the previous owners left us some which was really kind of them we've got oak trees got crab apples medlars all sorts and going back to apple the book mm. do you have a favorite recipe in that if we were only able to cook one which would it be 
I, oh, that's tricky. I change my mind regularly. At the moment, because it's, you know, we're coming out of winter, there's a delicious pork and cider stew in there. It's quite simple. It's not particularly difficult to cook, but it's one of those where you can use shoulder or belly. So it's got a nice bit of fat in it. So you cook that for a long, long time, four to four to five hours with a whole bunch of veg. And, you know, I recommend certain veg in the book, but to be honest, this is a bit of a fridge raiding recipe. You can just throw anything in there. And a pint of cider because everything is better with a pint of cider and uh, just leave leave it to stew for a number of hours. And it's just the the fragrance that it gives off with the herbs that I put in it as well. Time and bay. Your second secret is your agar, which I believe you inherited with the house. Mm. How has this transformed your cooking? Yeah, so this is something that it's it's new to me. Um, I've never had an agar before. When we first saw the house, the, the agar here is it's a bit battered and bruised. Um, it was actually put in almost fifty years ago, unbelievably, um, and it's still going strong. It's still you know sustaining us. And we saw it and we thought, oh, well, that's had a good life. We'll probably just get a new oven and put a new oven in. And then we moved in and it was the kind of, we entered the depths of winter and there was this there was this piece of furniture in our house that just radiated the most, I can't describe the heat. If you've, if you've been around an Arga, you know what I'm talking about, but the heat it gives off is something else. It's almost like a loving heat. I saw it described as a bum warmer recently, and that's exactly what it is because anybody who comes into our house, they gravitate towards the Arga. And it's this just like warming hub of the home. And I just think it's, uh, we're, we're actually keeping it now. We're going to renovate it. It's going off in a, in a couple of weeks to be renovated just so that we can kind of bring it up to date somewhat. And hopefully it will go on and give us another few decades of use. But I just think there's something amazing in these traditional innovations, really, that they, they stand the test of time. Has it changed the way that you cook? As yeah. obviously you have considerably less control with Naga. Do you now cook in quite a different way? Absolutely. So as a recipe writer, I have to be very specific in the, you know, the temperature that I um, advise people to cook things at, the amount of time it's it's quite and also of course the the heat but um with an agar you can't see anything that's inside because they're you know big cast iron doors there's no temperature control you don't have a lovely digital stop clock on the on the on the oven to tell you when to take it out and so it's a real sensory experience cooking with an agar so you're really relying on your you know your taste and your, and your sense of smell and, and even like the the sound of the food to understand when it's finished already i actually learned i think pip told me a while ago that he found out that an agar was made uh, created by somebody who was blind um, really? and that totally made sense to me yeah, yeah. Um, it does it's, it, it's it's it really encourages you to kind of get back to the senses with with cooking and that makes you a much stronger cook so now instead of you know a specific amount of time I'm looking at when the food is exactly at that point when it's kind of going nice and crispy and caramelized and so I'm, I think it does make me better as a cook. That's so interesting. Do you think as a result you're generally becoming more instinctive rather than scientific as a cook? Yeah, I managed to relax a, a, a hell of a lot because I was quite, I suppose, uptight in the kitchen. Because well, as a recipe writer, control. I get it, of course. Um, yeah, I just control everything, but it has made me relax a lot. And I just love the way that that you know you can throw something into the agar, and we we make um, stocks, a lot of stocks in in the agar at the moment. Uh, but we're quite forgetful. So we'll, you know, we'll have a roast dinner on a Sunday and we'll throw all of the bones and the carcass into a stock pot with, you know, some bay leaves from the tree outside, all of the veg that we want to include. And we'll put it into the cooler of the ovens in there. It might stay in there for two days because we forget about it. Oh and then- gosh, that reminds me of growing up. My mum used to leave pine nuts for days in the bottom oven of our agar. Mm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You have to kind of, you have to be a little bit careful. You know, we've had a few accidents already um but something like a stock is is, is okay on the, in the coolest um, oven and it comes out and it's just so rich and, and it's got such a depth of flavor thinking now to the rest of your house you're facing quite hmm. a big project aren't you Yes. Well, so we bought the house. It's like I said, it's 150, 60 years old. And it was renovated to a certain degree in, in the 70s, in like 1972. And so a lot of the, the kind of bare bones of the house needs to be needs to be updated. So for example, things like the heating, the electrics and all of that. So at the moment, we're going through probably the more boring part um, of house renovation. But we, we have, it's over three floors. So what we're doing is we're starting at the bottom with the kitchen because that's the most important room to us 
and we're kind of working out from there and we think it's going to take us like maybe five to ten years to do the whole house but we're, we're not in a rush we're going to take it very slowly and, and just kind of live in it and, and feel the house and let the house tell us what it needs that's such a lovely way of looking at it i think it's great to give yourself the time to get it right rather than trying to do it all in one go which is what I'm currently trying to do. Mm. Now, your third secret is all about local producers and makers. Tell us why you're enjoying connecting to those again. Yeah, it's something that I hadn't anticipated when I moved back to the countryside because I grew up here and I'm just kind of used to it. But being disconnected from the rural community uh, when I was in the city um, has been a real joy to kind of get back to. We have, we're really fortunate in this part of the country. We have, you know, in a few miles away, we have incredible cheese makers, incredible um, veg produce. We have wonderful butchers who who will source anything that you want. And so it's been amazing from a food point of view to really get back to the food landscape of this part of the country and understand kind of what grows locally or is reared locally. But then also, we're because we're obviously doing the house up, we've been able to talk to local furniture makers, for example. We're looking at getting a couple of pieces commissioned specifically for the house. And so finding people who live, again, just a few fields away who can create wonderful things with wood is amazing. And, and talking through ideas with them has been a really kind of inspirational process. We are also... Um, we have a lot of willow in this part of the country, so there are a lot of weavers. And I'm looking at exploring, you know, things like fencing for the veg patch, but also how we might be able to incorporate that within the house, because I feel like using those kind of local trades is really important to me. Yeah, and I think bringing in materials that feel appropriate and local to the area is so lovely. James, thank you so much for joining us. I've loved discussing seasonality kitchens and recipes and your project and new life in the country so thank you again for coming on the podcast thank you for joining us for this week's inspiring episode of the well-crafted life a future homes production from homes and gardens and martin moore i am sarah spateri and my editor is matt gibbs we hope you'll listen in again next week mm-hmm.